very humble to speak here, uh, considering the distinguished speakers. There is some nepotism, so Nick is supervising my PhD. I should probably disclose that one. And also, the questions that we had on exercise physiology are interesting as well, because I will come on to that. So why research syncope in the military? Well, we don't really know whether it's less common in civilian groups than it is in the military, but uh, we do know that we put our people in certain situations which does precipitate it, as you can see. This is the Queen's Birthday Parade. Uh, if you go sort of right, which out of shot is, is horse guards, uh, where currently uh, <laughs> Trump is invading, uh, Trump supporters are invading horse guards currently at the moment. I've had some photos through. Um, so over the next 20 minutes, I'll cover some of these stresses. Uh, we'll look at the etiology of syncope and service personnel and, uh, and the incidents as, as well. And we'll try and sort of look at the countermeasures that we're looking into, really from an occupational perspective. And occupation is key when it comes to the military. And I'll touch on some of the research I'm doing. As you can see, this is all done in a very orderly process. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that, um, so the Queen's Birthday Parade is on the 8th of June. If you have two hours spare, you can watch on television. And um, we usually have about 10 of these every Queen's Birthday Parade, for, for about 1,000 troops on parade, okay? So um, it's your perfect orthostatic stress test, okay? Uh, these are adapted from the 2016, so the earlier guidelines. And um, so what type of syncope do the UK Armed Forces uh, get? Well, we have a heavily skewed population of young white men, okay? So that heavily skews, really, um, what we see. Um, we also screen people from a cardiovascular perspective, so they all have an ECG and a physical examination, so we do see less cardiac syncope. We do still do see some, because obviously it does, it does occur, but we do see less than probably in the civilian population. The volume depletion of prostatic hypertension is mostly an operational thing, and I'll come on to that, things like D&V and obviously being shot. Um, and so the vast majority we see is, is, is reflex syncope, okay? And there are certain stresses that we, um, seem to be inherent with the military, particularly thermal stress. And a lot of my research that I'm focusing on is, is sort of the interchange between syncope and heat illness. Okay. And in terms of looking at those ESC guidelines, the real sort of things that we see is post-exertional syncope, largely because we make our people exercise a lot, and orthostatic because we make them stand up a lot. Okay. Alcohol, we try to tell them to avoid. And there's a huge sort of uh, interplay between these three things, okay, and one, one precipitates the other. So how common is it? Well, this is US data. We don't actually know how common it is in the UK armed forces. We're still sort of liaising with defence statistics to shore up that figure. And I appreciate that there is two different populations, different environmental conditions, but it's around 15.1 per thousand person years, which compared to civilian populations, the figures vary quite widely, but... They sort of between 6 and 30, they tend to say. So it's about middle, but we do put our people in more stress. It's more common in recruits because they're younger and also they're standing up more and being taught to exercise more. And if we sort of extrapolate those figures for uh, the populated risk, population at risk for the UK armed forces, obviously our, our military is significantly smaller than the Americans, we would think it's around about 2,500 per year. You may think it's just something that happens on the, the Queen's Birthday Parade and on, on, on sort of drill and standing up straight for long periods of time, but actually this is a real problem on operational deployment. So um, this is um, looking at some data from people who are presented to the medical admissions of the deployed hospital in Camp Bastion, Afghanistan. So 10% of all admissions. And the vast majority of, appear to be a sort of a combination between heat illness, vasovagal, some unknown, and cardiogenic was really... Um, much less, which you'd expect in young, fit, white men. Let's go back one. So is it an increasing problem? Um, probably. It will become an increasing problem. And, and that's because, I don't know if you've uh, read on the news, but we now have women coming into ground close combat roles. So a woman can take any role at all in the British military, whether the SAS, the guards, foot guards, horse guards, whatever they want to do. And so women we know are more prone to syncope, and so that's something that we're uh, looking into from that perspective. So what can be done? Well, we need to look about the, at this from the occupational perspective. So if I put private blogs on midodrine or fludricortisone, 
I'm going to influence his occupational role. Okay, so private blogs is a clerk who sat behind a desk, and when he deploys, he sits behind a desk. It's not really going to make much difference. But if he's actually a, you know, a frontline infantry soldier or a pilot, that's going to be a problem. Okay, and it's essentially going to turn him into a non-deployable role, so it's going to be hard for him to deploy, just because we can't guarantee we're going to be able to get these medications to a forward operating base in the middle of Helmand province. Okay? So it's going to influence what he's going to be able to do, and that's going to mean he's going to have to be downgraded, and he's not going to be able to deploy, and that's going to affect his career progression, and he's not going to like that for a condition that isn't going to you know, pose a mortality risk for him. Okay? So... What are we looking at? And this is the real sort of um, interaction between sort of what I'm hoping to do in terms of my research and exercise physiology and looking at those key th three things, orthostatic tolerance, post-exertional syncope and thermal stress. Okay. Um, so this is the original study that I can find on salt supplementation. Uh, Roger Hainsworth in, up in Leeds. This was over 20 years old. And this was done using low body negative pressure uh, and head up tilt, which I know isn't sort of in vogue with a lot of people. Uh, and looking at sort of time to syncope on this one and plasma volume. And the real thing here is the plasma volume increase that you see, so the amount of water that sits in the blood. And uh, this study was interesting in that um, the people who had a low 24-hour urinary sodium improved. They improved in terms of their orthostatic tolerance, they improved in terms of their plasma volume. Those who already had a high 24-hour urinary sodium, so already ingested a lot of salt in their diet, didn't really improve. And arguably for our soldiers, they don't have the best diet, bless them. So we may find that actually salt supplementation isn't going to be that effective for them. So what we're looking at instead is other ways of expanding the plasma volume. And if you go to the sort of sports science community, this is key. Is anyone here a sort of Olympic level triathlete or a very high power triathlete or endurance runner who does the marathon de sable or anything like that? Salt loading is, is a thing, you know, they all do it and they all take on other things as well. So we, what we're going to do is try and bring those into the syncope world and see what happens. Making a special drink. Water drinking, that sort of gastropressor reflex that isn't mediated by plasma volume increase but appears to support the blood pressure. Uh, and that's, again, been, been sort of demonstrated using low body negative pressure. And over a period of around about 40 minutes, it's not a long period, but it kind of bought an episode if you just take a 500 ml slug of water. What we wanted to know is... Um, we've, talk, we've sort of heard about the spansionic volume and how important that is in terms of mobilising that into the, the central blood volume. Is if we can cause spansionic vasoconstriction by making that water ice ice cold, albeit that you know, most people are going to get headaches, <laughs> uh, but will that have an effect? And we're going to do that study in Vancouver in August and see, see what the results are. Compression. Now, we've heard some things about compression. Um, and Nick and I have had a conversation about compression as well. Um, generally, what I've found in terms of doing my research on it in, is that if you're not using pneumatic compression, it doesn't really work. And there's sort of lots of stuff in terms of uh, from the exercise physiology world looking at uh, whether or not it's a performance enhancing aid, an ergogenic aid. But actually, um, from a syncope perspective, I'm not really sure. This is the one positive study. Um, that I liked, and it was looking at 60 millimetres of mercury using low-frequency pneumatic compression, and that does appear to have a, a beneficial effect. But, I mean, that involves a lot of sort of gadgetry, and it's the sort of thing that you give to stop DVT in, in bed in people in hospital and stuff. It's a lot of gadgetry. It's not just a case of putting on your Spanx in the morning. Um, but that, of course, is a study that needs to be done too. So not sure about that, and also I'm not sure about what the added thermal load to our soldiers would do to really... Um, aid things. Training. Well, we talked a little bit about training. I'll, I'll, I'll just touch on, on training now. The army loves training. They'll train for anything. We love training. If you can train for it, it's great. This is training you can do when you're asleep, which is fantastic. So if you just stick some bricks under your bed, you increase your plasma volume, and that has a beneficial effect to improve your orthostatic tolerance. Tilt training. I've not seen a positive study for this that I believe personally. These are two negative ones that I do believe, and I think it's exactly as Prof Raj says, it's just, people just don't tolerate it. They don't want to be tilted repeatedly in hospital for prolonged periods of time, and they don't want to stand up against the wall. Lower body negative pressure training, though, might be something different, because you can do it lying there watching the TV and just have a low amount of lower body negative pressure, and that's a study that we're going to do. So we'll see if that's beneficial. 
for these people who don't really want to take medications. Postural sway is an interesting one. So if you were to sort of tilt everyone in the room, we know 10% of people will have a positive tilt, even though they've never had syncope before. And it's similar with lower body negative pressure, head up tilt. Um, you suck all the blood down into the legs, and some people faint really quickly, and some people don't. And these people who faint really quickly have never fainted in real life, but for some reason they faint really quickly on a head up tilt, and they faint really quickly using low body negative pressure. Now, if you look at them, and this is quite important in terms of the parades that we see, so if you were to watch the Queen's Birthday Parade on the television uh, on Saturday, you'll see that the soldiers sway backwards and forwards like this sometimes, like this, and you think, oh my God, he's going to go down. He's going to go down, bless him. And they sway backwards and forwards. But what we've actually seen is that this appears to be some sort of innate thing that they've either learned or picked up or Lord knows how, but it appears to be some, a sort of coping mechanism that they've produce themselves, because that improves their orthostatic tolerance, uh, believe it or not, and that's been shown. And we're trying to do some more work to shore this one up, and hopefully we'll get that done in Canada in August as well. Thermal stress, well, this is a complicated field indeed. Um, as you can see, lots of different mechanisms at hand here. Um, but essentially, adding heat has certain physiological effects. Um, so it increases blood flow to the skin, it decreases your preload, um, the cardiac output increases, the blood's diverted from the spansionic system, but overall all the static tolerance is decreased in the heat. And basically uh, two years ago on the Queen's Birthday Parade, about 30 soldiers fainted because it was 30 degrees. And that funded my research pretty much. Um, so it's, um, it, heat is a real big thing. Um, but here's me heat acclimatizing here in Afghanistan. So Luckily, the body has a way of adapting to the heat. So we hold on to water, our sweat becomes a lot less concentrated, and uh, there's a lot less salt and chloride in there, and we pr produce it a lot more, so we produce a lot more sweat. Our plasma volume increases, our, our perceived comfort in the heat increases, and you'll know that if you take a sort of three-week holiday in somewhere hot by the end of it, you just tolerate the heat much better, you can stay up for longer. Okay, so the body actually adapts, but can we use this to treat uh, people who have vasovagal syncope. Can we heat acclimatise them to increase the plasma volume to be able to do it? Heat acclimation is something you do artificially, so that's something that you do in a sort of heat chamber. And I did a study fairly recently in Leeds where we heat acclimated people. So we got these triathletes because we didn't want them to get a plasma volume expansion just from training. So they're all very high train, trained already. And we heat acclimated them. So exercise on a bike to get their core temperature up to 38.5 degrees and maintain it for an hour. It looked horrible. It was horrible just standing in the heat chamber, to be honest. Um, and I think for that reason, it probably is going to work for a large population because, because people aren't going to be able to tolerate it. Um, but we did see a 10% increase in stroke volume okay, by, by them doing that. And that's largely probably mediated by an increase in plasma volume. <clears throat> Post-exertional hypotension is a sort of key facet of exercise. So when you exercise you get a period of around a couple of hours of having low blood pressure afterwards. Now, arterial pressure is a product of arterial inflow and vascular conductance, which is the sort of inverse of, of your total peripheral resistance. Now, if you reduce that to the components, as was done much better than I'm doing it right now, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, and systemic vascular conductance is sort of the vasoconstriction, the vasodilation that you have in your vascular beds. And that's sort of the interchange between these two things. Now, there's several complex factors at play here because you, when you exercise, you decrease your preload, uh, you elevate your body temperature, you change your arterial barrier reflexes, and you also increase your vascular conductance. And that appears to be something that you can ameliorate by giving antihistamines to. So it seems to be histamine-related. Now, the idea of that is that when you exercise, you're releasing histamine in your muscles, and that helps to sort of, by inflaming them, helps to push blood flow towards them to heal them quicker. Uh, so it's a sort of a, an adaptive physiology thing for that perspective. But interestingly, in POX patients, sometimes you give them antihistamines, I understand that they feel better. So there appears to be something else going on from this perspective. A lot of this work's been done by one lab, by a chap called John Halliwell in Oregon. And this is an H1 receptor antagonist, fexafenidine. And again, clearly uh, 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 removes that effect of post-exertional hypertension that people get. And when you tilt them, 
it also appears, it, this, this actually, so when you tilt them, this wasn't significant. So they did show that they were able to increase people's uh, tilt time, but by about 94 seconds. So <laughs> it wasn't quite significant. So there's something in it, and but difficult to say, really. And also, they've never been able to measure, show a rise in serum histamine following exercise. They have found it in the muscle, but not in the serum. So not sure, really. But we did think about doing a study to test it. So this was at the Brighton Marathon. So we did a prospective uh, observational case control study and did a sort of pre and post echocardiogram. We did some blood pressure monitors, pre and post, body composition, and then did a plasma histamine level and mast cell tryptase, which we froze at the point of capture and hoped that it would perhaps make it a little bit more um, accurate. Annoyingly, the Brighton Marathon this year, normally they have about sort of 20 to 30 people who collapse after finishing the marathon out of about 10,000 runs. But it was about six degrees, and so there was only about six. And we're just chewing through the data for this now to see what comes of it. And hopefully I'll be able to tell you about it if I'm invited back. So in summary, as you, I imagine you're all quite hungry, uh, the military is a unique population to study syncope. There are three key facets which we think is important, that being thermal stress, orthostasis, and, and, um, and post-exertional. That's a bit of a typo on there. But we think this probably is translational aspects to civilian groups. We're very much interested in conservative interventions or training interventions rather than medications, and certainly not pacing. Um, and I'm very happy to take some questions.